three, two, one. My name is Jerry Fielka. It is January 1st, 2021. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with Doug Rushkoff. Thank you, Clinton Ignatoff, for facilitating. Doug, the first question is, what is the best thing for a human being? Gah. Um, well, good morning. Um, good morning. The best thing for a human being? No, things. Things are tricky. Um, if things don't have to be like noun things, like, you know, a fork or a spoon or a hat or a radio, um, I think the best thing for a human being is connection to other human beings, is some, you know, social context. And without that, you're kind of, you can't really be a human being anyway. I agree, that is a great answer. And Doug, what's your favorite, favorite form of information? How information comes into you? Um, right now, I guess touch. Yeah. You know, that's a biggie. You know, and it's, I guess partly because there's just not enough of it, especially right now in, uh, in COVID times. Um, I'm becoming, you know, all the more aware of how, you know, touched, starved we are. I think even people that are having lots of sex or whatever, it's not that. I mean, they're still touch starved because they, yeah. it, it, it's, we're just not in a touchy, a, a touchy world. You know, so it's like so much of me comes out to other people in uh, in words and whether it's spoken or written, it's all language. Um, but yeah. there's very little touch expression, dance expression, you know, even I mean, we can kind of see each other through here, but even facial yeah. uh, uh, connection and rapport is so uh, it's been it's been so minimized and you know and those those receptors depleted that uh maybe i'm overvaluing them but it seems like they're pretty important and pretty no it's great great answer human uh craig baldwin said the same thing mm -hmm. uh human touch so uh why do you think humans collect or gather information um well sometimes for for uh for safety, you know, you, you learn which berries are poisonous and which ones aren't, which, you know, sections of the woods are more likely to have the dangerous animals than the others. So, you you know, if you walk a certain place and there's a, a bear, you know, you're going to remember <laughs> and yeah. restore that information. Um, you know, so I think mainly it's, it's you know, survival and safety um, you know, that we do it, but, you know, that's, that's, I would, I would hope, you know, that part of developing, you know, as a civilization is, is, you know, learning to, to store other kinds of information and pass on, you know, more complicated stuff. Well, you does, know, uh, you know, that's think, Korzybski, you know, that goes back to, Kor Kor yeah. you know, Korzybski and, and his idea that, that human beings bind time, you know, that, that, that plants bind the energy of the sun and that animals, because they can walk around, they bind the energy of a place and human beings, because they can share information, they can, you know, they can bind time so that my child doesn't need to learn everything I learned through experience. They can, I can tell them don't go down over there. That's where the big bear is. And they don't have to take all the time to learn that themselves and they can move on, you know, to the next place, you know, and that's, that's part of why it's such a sin to, you know, to actively, you know, gaslight, you know, the way so many people are doing today, you know, why, why disinformation is such a, a I see it anyway, it's such a crime against, against humanity because that's that's so much of what defines us is our our kind of shared you know informational commons that to pollute it intentionally with bad information stuff that that 
you've error checked, but know that it's <laughs> full of errors yeah. and then deploy it. It's, it's really yeah. cool. No, that, that was good. And do you think this need or want to collect information is innate or invented? Meaning, is it more innate or more invented? I mean, I guess it, you got to look at whether you think humans are innate or invented. But um, I, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty innate. Uh, you know, it it got, yeah. it gets more complex, but you know, I yeah. think it's pretty instinctual. Doug, can you conjure up your earliest memory ever, or one of them? Yeah. And what? Do you want to just briefly describe it? Oh, one of my earliest memories is my um, grandfather. He was, uh, uh, I was in a crib on my back and he was, um, uh, uh, I had this, uh, I don't know what you call it, like a, a plastic chain, almost like a necklace of these squishy plastic things it's one of those classic 1960s fisher price things they still make them they kind of interlock these there's like a orange cylinder and a red circle and a blue square and they just kind of interlock and he was um hanging it over me and i knew that it was um entertaining to him for me to be laughing and demonstrating all the the qualities of being entertained by him so i remember kind of faking my amusement reaction to him in order to get him to laugh because i found him amusing and that was good that was beautiful and doug i want to thank you you're very articulate and you're well-spoken. I really appreciate how well you're coming off to me, even through this Zoom technology. Uh, so is, is memory more a curse or more a blessing? I mean, there's all these binary. You're into binaries. You. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just jumping off points, so you don't have to answer the question. But, yeah. you know, it's just sort of your, your tendency uh, to discuss the services and disservices of memory. Uh, um, I mean, I would, I, I, I mean, I think one of the objects of the game of life is to live a life where memory is more of a blessing than, than a curse. You know, yeah. I mean, I feel privileged and grateful that I can look back and not be uh, not feel guilty and upset for that many things. I mean, I made wrong choices, but mostly those wrong choices have fallen on me. You know, uh, I, I, I believe in, you know, the sort of karmic debt, but I think karmic debt is something that really gets you as much or more in this lifetime than any other. And memory for, for people who've really been shitty, um, Mm, that's that's uh that's a shame but it's weird i remember i was we, we doing um uh we went my daughter and i went for christmas last year to my uh brother-in-law's family and they kept whenever there was a good experience or something good that happened that a couple of them would say i mean they're kind of really christian people and a couple of them would say um oh that you know we're making we're making good memories now or that'll make a nice memory that and it was it was a weird it was to me it was a strange construction um but i realized it's partly from a different culture you know from a sort of a, a, a an american virginian christian culture and that oh we're going to have these experiences and make memories and it was like it was interesting i guess it's a hallmark kind of a culture or some it's another thing. It's not. It's not as much part of. I, I'm so much. Uh, I'm so embedded in kind of progressive values and the workers uniting. And you know, uh, my you know, my grandmother was a Bolshevik who marched with Eugene Debs. So my whole thing is 
it's not, it was always about striving. How do we get out of the ghetto? How do we get into the suburbs? How do we get a good job, a good this? It's always so, but never it's like, oh, wow, you're going to make a memory? It's like, wow, that's weird. <laughs> that, it reminds me of uh, Fireside Theater saying, everything you know is wrong. And, you know, our whole goal as uh, pseudo media, media colleges is to unlearn everything with these great people. Know. How do we unlearn all this? But um, let's continue on, Doug, and um, please tell me an early role model or someone who had an impact on you within your immediate family and then outside your immediate family, and specifically, what was that impact? Just briefly. Um, I don't know. My brother had a big impact on me. He was um, two or three years older than me, but he was very good. You know, he he at least from my perception, he did everything between the lines, you know, he colored by the numbers and did his homework and was good and, and all. And um, good to a point that I kind of realized if I wanted to differentiate, I would have to be something else. You know, if he was going to go, you know, Apollonian, I was going to go Dionysian, you know, and, uh, you know, so if he was going to be the scholastic one, I went into theater and the arts and creativity and, and, and the weird. If he was going to um, spend his life um, confirming, uh, uh, confirming status quo reality, um, I was going to spend it undermining it, you know, which is kind of what I've done. That's good. It's actually your um, the the whole thing of my approach, and you're helping me always. People like you help me rethink my questions because I know I have this binary thing, and that indeed helped me understand that you were maybe reactive to the way he was, and and it, it, it's this thing that humans might be hardwired for binary or hardwired for conflict. So um, the, the next question would be, someone early in your life who made an impact on you, who is a role model, and what specifically did you get from them outside your immediate family? Um, there was a guy, um, I don't know if our audiences will remember you well. There was a guy on TV named Soupy Sales. Oh, yeah. Who had a, um, he had a kid's show. <laughs> if you, I'm sure if you weren't a kid and watched it, it was like watching Pee Wee Herman or Ren and Stimpy or something. That this was yeah. a guy with the mm. kind of satiric self-consciousness of um, Paul Krasner. You know, or Abby Hoffman, or someone like that, doing a kids show. So when I say kids, like kids show in in like uh, uh, quotation marks, and I feel like as a young little baby media theorist watching Soupy Sales, I was aware that he was both doing a kids show and commenting on the kids show at the same time. You know, yeah. sort of like Mister Rogers meta. Um, and and there was a there was an edge to it, but there was a um, there was a danger to it that um, that excited me and that got me actually interested in the theater. The whole idea of here's this socially constructed thing that we're gonna do, right? Here's a play, a kids show, a thing, but we're both still here watching this thing happen, aren't we? Who else sees me? And I felt like I was one of the few people in the audience of like, oh, Soupy, I see you. I see <laughs> what you're doing. You're talking to me and this sort of secret cabal of other people who get that this is meta, that this isn't just another kid's show. And that um, that was influential because then for me, you know, life became so much about finding the others, you know, whether it was uh, uh, eventually it seemed to be that that was the psychedelic community. That those were the people who were like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I've, you know, I've been there. Have you? I was like, yeah, I've been there too. <laughs> you know, that was 
Yeah, that was really good, Doug. You got it. And you got to sing praise to Soupy because the only footage of Clifford Brown blowing his amazing sa uh, trumpet is from the Soupy Sales Show. Wow. It's the only, only, known, only known footage. So uh, were you raised a particular religion? Yeah, uh, uh, American Reform Judaism. Did you ever check out officially? Sort of in, in yourself, did you check out? You mean de Judify somehow? You're not allowed. <laughs> you can't. That's a good, the good Nazi, way to. The Nazis will come for you no matter what you've said. You know? Oh, I mean, yeah. when they come knocking at the door. You can't just say, oh, I checked out. I checked out. <laughs> Like, no, they're still dragging you away. There's no, it's life. You can't get out. You can't. Yeah, but I, I'm saying. You I'm stop saying, believing, but you don't have to believe yeah. anything to be a Jew. Jew is a thing. It's like. Yeah. It's I, like, I didn't. You I, can't. You help, yeah, you, you helped me re rephrase it. Did you ever check out from practicing? Yes and no. It depends okay. what you mean, you know? Okay. So, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I stopped going to synagogue but yeah. you know as my grandmother would argue the synagogue is the hardest place to be a real jew I, we went to we went to the synagogue in her um boca raton uh, uh old people's village um this guy red buttons opened it called century village um and uh we went there and and we went one saturday morning to go to the synagogue on the premises there and I remember they took out the Torah and they start marching, you know, they go march up and down the aisles with the Torah. And then you're supposed to like kiss your talus or your prayer book and touch the Torah. And my grandmother started saying, you see, this is why I don't come. This is idolatry. This is idolatry. Um, and, and where she enacted her Judaism, which is where I do mine is in social justice work. You know, it's in, in it's it's in in trying to make the world a better place. Whether it, you call it, you know, tikkun olam, as as you know, many like to, or you just you know, you just consider it social justice. So I look at the so-called lapsed Jews who are yeah. with Black Lives Matter or the ACLU or you know Bernie or Marx, um, yeah. and say, oh well, they're doing the real thing. They're, they're enacting it. And you have synagogue is like going to your Grateful Dead concert or something. It's to give you yeah. some strength and a sense of community and, uh, you know, spiritual inspiration. But the Judaism happens, you know, on the streets. Yeah. No. Well, well, well spoken. Thank you. Do you pray, Doug? No, I don't. I, uh. I don't. I I meditate. I'll do yoga. Um, I don't daven, you know, as the Jews would put it. Um, I tried. I I wanted to see, and I maybe I didn't give it long enough. I decided I went to a uh, synagogue every you know Friday night and Saturday morning for like two years to see, you know, and did all did all the stuff. I mean, I didn't do tefillin in the morning and evening, but I did, you know, a good, normal, conservative Jewish um, tradition. And I just didn't find in the um, in the Siddur, the prayer book, in the the morning minion or the afternoon minion, in the 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 actual davening uh, uh, ritual. I didn't find the the. Uh, inspiration or openings you know the same way i i can in an unguided simple sitting uh meditation or in doing tai chi or yoga there's just there seem to be other ways to to uh to bring myself into into um useful states of of consciousness or openness than than that so and also, you know, synagogues are really are really tricky because they're they're these communities based on uh, kind of shared values of practice. How do we practice? You know, there's this great joke about they they find this Jewish guy on a desert island after he's you know been alone for fifty years, and he's built two synagogues on this desert island, 
And they ask him, why did you build two synagogues? And he said, oh, well, this is the synagogue I go to, and this is the synagogue I won't set foot in. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I love jokes to illustrate this stuff. Now, <laughs> Doug, if God exists, what do you want God to tell you after you die? Oh, um, assuming God speaks English or that I'll speak God. Um, <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when I'm dead, um, you know, I'd be, I'm really interested in the why, why, yeah. the why, why did he, why did he make the whole thing? Perfect. Um, Doug, do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? Oh, yeah, I don't think there's, I don't think evil is this thing external to us. I don't even think, I mean, there's people who do evil. You know, I think evil is a, is a verb. Um, yeah. So the same as, uh, 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 I mean, I think, I do think love exists, but I think love exists the way heat exists. It's like, just cause there's heat doesn't mean there's a thing called cold, right? Cold is the, is the absence of heat. It's not a thing in itself. Yeah, that was good. And so this is a question, Doug, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? I'm going to set it up with a few modern thinkers thoughts. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. JFK said, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. And Fellini says, I need an enemy. So it's a lot of thoughts, but the basic question is, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But first, Doug, how would you react to the Alan Watts? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Um, sure, but what part are you empowering by acknowledging them? Yeah. You know? I, I I think uh, uh, in most cases, um, our enemies need empowerment. You know, you think Hitler felt powerful? No, he felt weak, obviously, or he wouldn't have been doing that. He felt unacknowledged, you know, so he created this giant, are artifice of of torture and murder. Um, you think Donald Trump feels acknowledged? Do you think he feels loved? You know? Do you think he feels seen? I don't think he feels truly seen. I think that's why he's got to go. Why he does these giant, uh, uh, you know, conventions and 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 rallies. He, it's just not because he doesn't feel seen doesn't feel heard so no i so first i would i would say um yeah i agree with watts but i have a feeling he um he's thinking of that as a negative thing and i would look at it as a positive thing yeah and then how would you advise someone to deal with an enemy just simply um you're as responsible for your enemies as you are for your friends you know that's what we've we've forgotten you know that's you know i have a friend uh, uh sarah pesson who's working on a book she wants to call like hate and protect you know and, uh, and the idea is is that you you are responsible for the people you don't like and that's not um it's not a matter of learning to like them or for them to like you you know, this, this, you know, the, the kumbaya approach to civics is, uh, uh, it's great for Oprah, but it's not the way things happen, you know, and I, I bought it for a long time, you know, when Rodney King during the riots, he was saying, why can't we all just get along? Um, because we don't get along and we're not going to get along. We don't, 
We don't like each other. You know, we're horrible. Um, um, so then what? Well, then you have to learn how do you get to, how are we, how can we engender a sense of responsibility for people we actually don't like, that people we hate, for our enemies? Um, yeah. And that's, you know, that's the hard part. I mean, and Torah goes to that, you know, and they're basically saying to do that. But then the weird thing about Torah, it says, yeah, do that, do that. But there's this one group of people, the Amalekites, them, you can't be, you can't even, them, if you, you got to just kill them if you see them. Because um, the Amalekites, they, what they got known for in Torah was um, they would attack you from behind. You know, they wouldn't, they, they would just pick off the, you know, women and children in the back of the, in the back of the, the you know, because you're nomads walking around. They'd get you from, and it was like, oh, that's, you know, that's not fair. Um, you just die no matter what. We'll just kill you whenever we see you. Um, so it was interesting that even in Torah, there's like this group. Now you, you're never going to do it. About anything about those ones, you just kill them. Um, you know, and I remember when they when when you know God sends the Jews or what the Israelites, whatever, to go attack this some group. I think it was Amalekites. He was like, kill all, kill all of them, all of them, the women, children, the dogs, everything. You got to just wipe them out. And like uh, someone didn't like they let a couple of dogs and children live, and it's like God killed that person. Then, <laughs> I was yeah. like, no, I said get everyone. Well, that was good. Uh, it reminded me of American Indians say, your enemy is your best teacher. And Ram Das had the great line, I'm having a real hard time loving George Bush. So, yeah. Doug, the next question concerns James Joyce being the first projectionist, projectionist in Dublin over 100 years ago. He basically checked out. He said, this is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Years later, Faulkner said, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we have to recreate things in order to get them? Why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? Well, I mean, this is that that goes back to the um, probably the the answer is the same is the same answer that God gives when you ask why. You know, God is the whole thing, right? If God's the whole thing, then why you know separate off part of yourself into a world of illusion? You know, it's in order to know that you're there. You know, it's in order to. That's why you would, if you were one thing, it's like, how do you know you're there? Break off, break yourself into two, so that you can talk to yourself. You know, it's like. So I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, we we. There's a way of learning. It's like creating a school or a, a theater or an improv or an experiment or fiction. It's a way of musing. Um, you know, and our problem today is partly as a result of the writer's strike of the 1980s, I guess it was, um, we decided to pollute our dream space with nonfiction. You know, we created what we call reality TV, which is fictional television utilizing uh, pieces of news or reality in there. Um, and I think what we didn't realize when we started to do that is we would end up not just polluting our dream space with the real, but polluting our real with the dream space. You know, and now people can't tell the difference so that the most entertaining or compelling fiction becomes the, the, the competes for our agreed upon consensus reality. You know, so, right, the QAnon story is way more compelling and satisfying than what's actually, what's actually going on here, which is pretty just mundane stupidity, abuse, and, 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 yeah. and horror. Um, but it, boy, isn't it nice if there's somebody in charge and a cabal of pederasts and, oh, we know who to blame. And I mean, it's, it would be great. It would be so easy um, to have that. It's a, it's a, uh, you know, people look at it as a horror show, but it's like, oh my God, it's as nice as, it's as easy as walking dead. You know, the zombies move slow on the horizon. You just, this is not so bad. Um, you know, there's no Twitter. There's no <laughs> it's, it's, it's easy. Um, so uh, 
I mean, I think that we create the, the we create fictional spaces, and it's kind of uh, and many cultures do it. it it's a sacred, uh, yeah. it's a sacred process. You know, theater, even Teos, it's, it's truth. It's 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 God. Um, it, it was understood as as a sacred thing, and I think we've made it profane by by sort of mixing up the 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 sacred and the secular, the sacred and the and the ordinary, and um, we've got to. I think we've got to parse that. We've got to parse that out again. Very good, Doug. Uh, you recalled uh, the great Paul Krasner uh, asked his guru, "Why is there evil?" And he says, "To thicken the plot." <laughs> so um, yeah, what? it's beautiful. You know, it's beautiful. And also, you know, Paul Krasner is also partly responsible for this mixing of theater and and reality. You know, the original fake news was Paul Krasner writing that, you know, JFK is, is fornicating the exit wound in JFK's skull um, <laughs> on, on Air Force One, that Jackie O walked in on it. Um, and he put that in an article along with all the regular facts. And he was doing it really as part of what, you know, Robert Anton Wilson and, and other folks in the, the Discordians would call uh, Operation Mindfuck. You know, that, yeah. that we've got to to destabilize consensus reality a bit in order to yeah. open up new possibilities. But that, ex that, that experiment seems to have gotten out of control or the weapon of destabilization has gotten in the, in the wrong hands. I mean, it's not just a prank now. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more serious gaslighting. And that's, that's tricky. It's not just to get, you know, no longer is it you destabilize someone so they go, oh, right, I get it. Um, you destabilize them and keep them there, which is kind of cruel. Yeah. Now, Doug, what first attracted you? And I'm just going to call it your creative pro projects because you do so much and you're, you're massively um, talented in so many fields. What first attracted you to pursue your creative projects? You're going along, you're reading, you're seeing films, you're reading Mad Magazine or whatever, and then you go, I can do that. What kicked you over into that? Like, I can do that. Um, I don't know, I was probably, I, was, I think I was five or six, and my parents took me to see um, Zero Mostel in Fiddler on the Roof. And Parents took their kids in the 60s to see Fiddler because it was like, oh, this is your up. Uh, this is who you are. I mean, because I'm a, a a Jew whose family is from one of those towns, you know, actually a town called Kishnev that had these big pogroms, famous pogroms. My great grandfather was hanged in his store window and my you know, grandfather was thrown in a well, the whole thing. So we lived Fiddler um, before we got to America. So they took me to that. And for me... Um, it was a soupy sales moment. It was, we go, everyone sits down in this, you know, whatever, seven, eight hundred, I don't know how many seats there are on a Broadway theater, say 800 seat theater. And everyone in the, the seats agrees to be quiet. And the people on that stage, they're all talking about stuff and singing and whatever. And this guy, um, the Zero Mostel, who's Tevya, so he's an actor playing the part of this guy, this Russian Jew, looks right at the audience, like right at me and talks to me about, here I am, I'm in this town called Anatevka and this is how we live. And I'm like, what is this reality? What, what is going on here? He's not Russian Jew, clearly. He's an actor on a stage, but he's dressed as a Russian Jew and all these people are in the town and he's the only one that knows I'm here and is talking to me about what's happening there. So it was like this Thornton Wilder stage manager, director dressed to the audience, uh, uh, crazy reality bending moment, this, this agreement of who's going to sit and say nothing while the other half of the people are on a stage on lights saying things. And... I was like, oh, I, I get, I, I can, I want to. It wasn't just do theater, although it, 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 it originally was. I just want to do theater. It was, I want to experiment with these sort of liminal places between realities, in order to create uh, new perspectives on 
both history and the moment that we're in. Wow, that was well put. It's like that guy on the radio. They say, summarize your life in five words. You know, your mission. You did it well. <laughs> so um, uh, <clears throat> you're pursuing, it's sort of, you're pursuing these things now and you, you've done it well. If, if you had to rate these three elements in your success, luck, skill, and ambition, how would you rate them? Um, well, luck is first, you know, luck being born into a upwardly mobile middle-class, you know, American family that was even considered white by the 1970s, you know, but, you know, we weren't white, but we became white, you know, we, we, I remember, you know, funny, my dad wanted to join this golf club when we moved to Larchmont called the Bonnie Briar Country Club on Weaver Street. And he had a friend there and his friend told him he couldn't join because he was Jewish. The club was restricted. And then by like the late 80s, the friend called back and said, oh, we're not restricted anymore. You could you can join. And my dad was like, fuck you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it was almost as if, you know, you know, it was funny being white meant being in a position to say fuck you to them um, uh, for him. But, you know, because he was pissed off, you know, finally it's like, oh, now I'm OK. Now we're you know, but um, but but luck. I mean, being being a, a white kid with, a, you know, a scholarship to Princeton, um, you know, and a Westchester High School education. You know, and, you know, being lucky enough to be in a high school that didn't have the kind of drama program where there's teachers who direct the plays that you're in. It was a drama program where basically, okay, kids, you're on your own, you know, and it was like, all right, there's a theater over there. Let's just do stuff, you know. You know, we had a guy who was a, a kind of like a technical director for the, the the theaters, but we were on our own to do to do plays, and um, that was luck. That was luck too, because that forced a kind of industriousness and a figure it out. You know, we just go to a sh see a show in New York and then come back and it's like, okay, I think I know how to do this, and you wing it, and um, that was a. A tremendous privilege because then it got me to the place um, in 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 life to be a kind of fake it till you make it, yeah. Uh, 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 you know, artist and thinker, you know, and that's that was that was luck. But I do do have some innate improvisatory skill, you know. So the first time I got invited to a a, a media ecology event was um, the McLuhan seventy fifth thing or the hundredth birthday or whatever it was that Lance and these guys did at Lincoln center. Yeah. I had written this book media virus about how, um, uh, well, you know, now we know about viral media. So it was about the first book about that. Um, and so they invited me to this thing and to do a discussion with postman and to do this 20 minute talk. And I got up there and I said, you know, I, I've, I've never read McLuhan. I hadn't by then. It was 1994 or five. I hadn't read any McLuhan. And it's like, I will, but it's like, but it was sort of like a situation of, well, you know, hum a few bars. And you know, <laughs> boy, Marsha would have loved that one. That's hum a few bars. I think he would have, though, you know, after reading oh, it, yeah, he would have yeah. been like, yeah, exactly. You it's don't totally have to. Totally. It's, it's like, like uh, maybe a memorable. Right. Yeah. It's 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 true. True. I would be sure. To hear to hear a little and make some assumptions, then read it and be wrong, right? Like everybody else. So, no, you you captured uh, Marshall. You, the, the big flip on Marshall being exposed and Woody is that Woody flipped Marshall completely, and he made Marshall say a question, which is, "You mean my whole fallacy is wrong?" And he made him say it as a statement. And Marshall would have said, "Hey, a half a truth is still a lot of a truth." So this was good. Um, uh, Doug, 
a screenwriting teacher told me a great film or great art is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. Kubrick says the exact opposite. Great art, great film, great book is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention play in your creative process? Well, it's interesting. Kubrick means it and he doesn't. I mean, Kubrick has an intention in his films and it's to show that there's no narrative you know that the narratives are things that we project onto these onto these things you know the the stories fold in on themselves and i mean that's why he doesn't even like his actors to know what's going on in the scene or he'll take the worst take you know the one where they just sound like they're saying words because he wants the audience to be able to connect, to connect the dots in, in any number of ways. Um, but that's an intention. And once you know that intention, it's a different thing. It's like David Lynch, you know, you could say he's got no intention. Of course he's got intention. It's just different intention. It's not the intention of the, the traditional attention of the uh, intention of the storyteller to help you get from here logically to there to there to there he wants you to go into it more like a dream where everything makes sense in another sort of way um so you know i i well i i get what you're saying and that's fine but let's um let's say uh, what yeah go ahead what's the intent of my work well let, maybe you can incorporate this question into asking because you're answering a question with a question, and that's you won. That's what is, this series is all about. Oh, so, you, yeah, but uh, it basically, Dusham says there's no art without an audience. What, how much are you thinking of your audience when you're creating before they consume it, you know, before they're reading it or seeing it or hearing it? How much are you thinking of your audience? Oh, I mean, almost entirely. Um, I mean, I, I originally looked at my uh, uh, career as I get to do the weirdest, most wonderful things that I can imagine. That's my job. It's to find the people who are having the weirdest, bestest fun. And my obligation to society for letting me have those experiences is to recreate them as best I can for everybody else. Yeah. To at least, uh, uh, if I were like a, a travel author, so I get to go to the Galapagos and Antarctica and the Philippines. My obligation is to craft stories about these experiences that let everyone else have them too and justify why they're letting me go have these experiences instead of someone else, right? Yeah. So, you know, and that's, you know, my first books, I looked at that way, especially, you know, Siberia, and media virus, these books that are almost, you know, a gonzo um, immersions in crazy, fun, wonderful cultures. And now as I'm older and have family and can't travel in the same way and can't, you know, I can't, you know, leave my family for more than a, a week at a time as a, as a, you know, traditional parent person. Um, then it's a matter of, of traveling through, um, head spaces and research spaces and and uh, going going deep into other places that people may not have time or energy or tenacity to explore. But again, if I'm going to get to spend um, you know that kind of time on a deep dive of an idea, then it needs to be at least uh, uh, of some service to humans. So. Yeah, every book that I that I start it, for me, and every project, every documentary, every comic is some uh, is is service first. You know, I look at it as as compensation to society, not as the uh, as the thing itself. Yeah. 
I appreciate that. And I'll tell you a little thing about Terrence McKenna that reminds me of this thing, allowing people to live vicariously through your, and that might not be the right word to apply to what you just explained, but uh, Terrence has been an enabler for so many young people to come to my Finnegan's Wake Reading Club. Over 20 years, we've been reading Finnegan's Wake out loud with a group of people connecting it with McLuhan. And they'll go, Terrence McKenna liked the wake? Oh, I got to check this out. And when I saw Terrence 20, 30 years ago in Santa Monica speak, you know, you could tell it was all these yuppies going, I can live vicariously and take LSD without taking it and just read his books and hear him talk. <laughs> you know, I don't have to trip out anymore. And so I says, Terrence, um, if you were in jail and they offered you a drug of your choice or a McLuhan book, because, you know, he highly praised McLuhan and, and Finnegan's Wake, he goes, I'd have them roll me up a big bomber. And I was like, how lame. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's, it's great for people to lead people into a path of, you know, what you said was uh, creative exp exploration, like to open open up the doors of perception and allow these people to see that there's other ways of thinking. So, uh, Doug, do thoughts create emotions? I don't know. I mean, my thoughts create emotions, but, um, you know, I'm sure emotions create thoughts too. You know, it's, I, you know, my, um, understanding of emotions changed uh you know over the last 20 years or so you know where i don't look at emotions as these uh mental states i mean i look at emotions as body states mm. that that they're you know and and you know the more we we learn about the body the more we know now that you know the heart and the liver and the stomach all have their own brains as well you know that your 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 thinking isn't just up in your your executive center it's it's down in these in these organs too so i i feel like uh, i've always thought about you know thoughts as as these as sort of ex abstract cognition and emotions as this uh, emotions are feelings, yeah. you know, in the, in the real sense of the word. And then we, we can put thoughts on them. It doesn't mean that the feelings are creating the thoughts, but they're uh, uh, to me, it's almost like two different universes. It's like the signified and the signifier or something. Yeah. And of course, my thing with binaries are it's more just trying to open up the door to a conversation. Does the brain more detect consciousness or more create consciousness? Um, I would say it, it more um, broadcasts. It, it receives and broadcasts. I'm kind of like the... Um, the model of the of the brain or the DNA or whatever it is as a as a well the brain is a as a radio and the DNA as an antenna, you know that it's uh, uh, that it manifests here, but it's not happening here. You know that this is more like, uh, but you know I was raised in a television media environment, a radio and television media environment. So yeah. my nervous system is, is primed to understand reality in that media metaphor. So, you know, just as the, the you know, in the age of radio, thinking people were talking about, you know, uh, uh, waves, you know, and seances and, uh, you know, Madame Blavatsky and all this kind of stuff. Uh, people raised in the television age are going to think about, um, you know, life as projection and hallucination and, you know, consensual hallucination and all that's all TV talk. Um, but it's, again, it's all, it's all a metaphor, a metaphor anyway. And I'm sure there's a, a, 
digital metaphor for what you know, what I'm understanding, oh, well, you know, brain as processor and reality as hologram or, you know, who knows what, you know, what they'll, that, what they'll that say. That was good guessing. I love those two words, guessing that, because I also think, Doug, you have ESP because you anticipated the next question. McLuhan learned from a poet that the artists are the antenna of the race and they're broadcasting the hidden psychic effects of the things we invent so that we can learn how to cope with what we don't like about the um, you know, effects, these hidden psychic effects. So McLuhan really said, hey, we can look to the artists to broadcast the hidden psychic effects, but we still ignore them. Why do humans still ignore the hidden psychic effects, even though we can turn to the artist to to uncover them? Oh, because it'll cost us money. <laughs> <laughs> no. If you turn, if you spend any time, any moment that you spend not producing or consuming, any moment that you pause to reflect and ask yourself, should I, um, is uh, 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 a betrayal of you know god's capitalist market's need for expansion and acceleration if you're not accelerating the market then you are a sinner under capitalism you're an enemy of the state i mean so yeah so of course we don't you know and that's why you know we'd rather you know we replace art with uh uh wonder woman 1984 yeah. you know which is Wonder Woman 1984 is actually a, a anti-feminist, anti-occult, anti-creative spectacle. You know, the, the theme of this thing is Wonder Woman is born special, right? She's born that way. She is a birthright to her Wonder Woman-ness. And the woman that wishes she could be like Wonder Woman, she is the supervillain because she wishes, because she wishes to be like that. You know, how dare you, how dare a, a major company, major media company cre both create superheroes and then punish anybody for wishing they could be like a superhero. Here's a role model, but don't wish to be like it. What is that? That is saying you are fucking hopeless no matter what. You know, and even, you know, and, and you look at even the, the counterculture and whatever, they're all watching, you know, Game of Thrones and and Black Panther and these 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 epic mythologies whose argument is that those who have a birthright to greatness, we should all fight for them. The ones with the birthright. But the ones who really just want to then, ones who look at it and go, wait a minute, why are they entitled to it by birth and I'm not? Those are the ones that you subjugate, right? And nobody's talking about this in the, in the white supremacy critiques, you know? <laughs> and this is like, and it's like, wait a minute, the biggest fucking blockbusters that are being rewarded as uh, as almost nods to social justice because they attack Trump, you know, not so secretly, um, are actually the most retrograde, um, chauvinist, racist um, uh, 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 spectacles I've, I've 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 yet encountered. Well, uh, Doug, there is somebody talking about, it, and it's you. And thank you. And as Frank Zappa <laughs> said, as Frank Zappa said so astutely, I'm. I may be a failure, but I'm not a miserable failure. So um, you, you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. That's Audrey Lord, the poet. Yvonne Rayner responded, you can if you expose the tools. What new tool do you suggest? What new tool? What or tool do I suggest exposing? Um, yeah, either way, you can put it in the context you want. Um, it's funny. Back when I was first 
you know, doing lectures on media literacy. I, uh, you know, I would use the Star Wars example of um, when, when, uh, you know, L Luke and, and Han Solo get taken prisoner by the Ewoks and um, C-3PO and R2-D2 tell a story about the, the empire and how awful the empire is. And, you know, R2-D2 is making all these crazy sound effects and C-3PO is telling this beautiful story in their language. And, you know, they, they are so, you know, um, um, entranced and moved by the story of the horrible empire and the war that the rebels are fighting that they not only release Luke and Hans, but they fight a war on their behalf. They die, many of them die fighting in this battle. And when I was watching that movie, you know, as a kid, basically, I remember thinking, uh, well, what if Darth Vader had gotten down to that planet first and told his story? And I, I remember when I was talking about, uh, when, I, when I, I tell that story in order to show that, that, that the rebels used two, two devices in order to win over the Ewoks, the, the rhetoric of C-3PO's story and the special effects of R2-D2's recreations. And that, that great propaganda, great storytelling tends to have those two, those two elements. You know, it's the, the, the rhetoric through which, which the story is told and the technology through which the story is told. And the more mysterious the technology, the, the more open you are to the, to the rhetoric, to the, to the storytelling. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's sort no, of the, that, it's that sort was of, good. Yeah. It's sort of that. I mean, you I, you were sort of asking which uh which medium or I guess, but it kind of doesn't matter. As long well, as you know as long as it's mysterious. So I guess I spend my time trying to demystify yeah. the various media that are being used. Um especially if the people using the medium or using the technology are not trustworthy. You know, they're, they're not, uh, I, I, I'm saddened, but I guess it's always been the case, but I'm saddened that we live in a world where people use magic for bad, you know, whereas magic should be used to open people to wonder magic is being used to, to, you know, create a uh, trickery and, and, and simulation of the worst kind. And, um, you know, and that's where, you know, that's where people like uh, uh, Kubrick are trying, or, or David Lynch are trying to do the opposite. Yeah. Say, no, no, I have no intent. There is no, I am not a propagandist. I'm an artist. Yeah. That's good. In um, Auden, the poet said that the mystery of art is that we don't really know if it activates or pacifies us. And I'm always, I'm always interested when people bring up this word mystery like you just did. Now, Moshe Feldenkrais works with healing and movement. Doug, he says that it's literally possible to identify weakness and incorporate it to become a strength rather than we're normally taught to overcome a weakness. Can you tell me a weakness that you've incorporated to become a strength? Yeah, and I also want to make sure I got a message from the platform. Oh, it says my microphone is noisy. Well, I'm I can hear What do you fucking think? Yes, it's noisy. <laughs> you sound I just fine. Don't worry about it. Except it's noisy. Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. I, again, I compliment you for being so dang articulate and warm in your communication spirit. Thank you so much. Oh, it's all the microphone. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, did, what you were asking uh, what was yeah, how tell me a, a weakness that you've incorporated to become a strength oh um, I guess my my ability to go meta you know um, as a kid I feel like the 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 reality that was being the, 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 the consensus reality of my family of origin placed me in an untenable position. 
you know, they, they, bless their hearts, they did contextualize me as the bad kid. And in order to defend against that definition in a, a very small, you know, family where I was not, um, I was not in charge of the definitions is I privately went meta on the situation and said, oh, this isn't what's going on. I'm outside this looking at how definitions are being assigned. So I went outside the system and, you know, I did it, you know, it ultimately in a way that's that, that at the time was kind of, you know, compensatory and defensive and neurotic, right? Is, uh, so it's a defense mechanism. Whenever I'm under stress, I'm going to go meta. I'm going to pull out. I'm going to, you know, take a bird's eye view or a God's eye view of the situation. And rather than actively participating or defending myself or engaging with the others, I'm going to go, okay. Um, but that ended up being, you know, uh, I ended up leveraging that as my superpower, you know, for, you know, for society or civilization. And I mean, that's, you know, it's McLuhan-esque in a way. It's you go, you know, oh, uh, you know, I don't like the situation. Let me perform a tetrad. Um, <laughs> you know, what's being retrieved here? Um, yeah. Flipping a breakdown into a breakthrough. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. Doug, are you more afraid of new ideas or more afraid of old ideas? Oh, I'm not afraid of ideas. I'm, I'm like... I'm... My fears are so, my fears are like, I'm afraid of like, the people with guns and, you know, dying in climate change and stuff like that. Um, well, I guess I'm, um, if anything, yeah, I would be more afraid of old ideas that ha are, are old ideas that have, military support, yeah. I guess, you know, so I'm afraid, I'm afraid of the dominator mentality. I'm afraid of capitalism. I'm afraid of um, empirical science wielded in a way as to, to try to overcome nature. Um, so yeah, there's, these are old ideas you know, based on largely kind of male fear of the soft, the squishy, the irresolvable, the liminal, um, the magical that um, that threatens to to well, it threatens uh, to to end to to create a whole lot of pain and suffering. I mean, I I think the premise. The underlying premise of our civilization may itself be a bad idea. And I don't yet know how far we have to unwind it in order to move in a healthy direction. Is perception reality? Oh, well, it's a reality. You know, I mean... It, there's 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 signal there's some signal in what we perceive i mean but there's also a lot of noise and a lot of uh uh, uh there's some poor reception and there's uh some poor analysis there's poor translation so yeah, our our perceptions are are related to reality. But you know how 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 close they are and how complete they are, you know, we have no way, you know, no way of really knowing. That's why we build tools. You know, but then you know, we realize that the tools are also colored by you know, the way in which they're created. So it's hard to know. Are we getting closer or are we getting further? Does the, you know, the telescope certainly brought us closer to something, 
right? But then further from something else. It's good old amplification and 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 amputation. Good. And uh, Doug, that anticipated a question Marshall just asked. He didn't really say, I got the answer. And it's the difference between technology and art. And we're always studying, trying to study the difference between art and science. He says, how about technologies as the collective unconscious and art as the collective unconsciousness? Can you suss out anything there, what he's trying to say or ask? So he's trying to say, you know, like conscious is different than consciousness. And technologies are the collective unconscious and art is the collective unconsciousness. Well, I don't even know if you need the conscious and the conscious or the unconscious or the unconscious in there. It's just the idea of, of technology being thing and and art being thingness yeah is interesting where you know the the i i wonder i mean i i always see technology as so but i was raised in a different environment than him but i see technology as so overt not as I mean, I, I get he's talking about environments, you know, when he sees when he says technology, he doesn't mean technology the way you or I or a regular person might think about, oh, a machine or a computer. So for him, technology is the environment created by a technology, more like, you know, uh, uh, Kevin Kelly's technium, I guess. That was good. And it really brought up this idea, TSA, tactile situation awareness. When a pilot is acting so fast because his plane is about to crash, he's got to look at all the, you know, make decisions like boom, boom, boom. And, and um, it's been said that kids nowadays, let's say millennials, are just like that. They have so many things going on. They're not relating to just one thing. We related growing up to the transistor radio in the telephone, in the car, but now there's so many more. Is there really more? And, you know, have we, has it really changed? People go, oh my God, you know, this is changing the world so much. Well, when we invented spoken word, it changed us. When we invented printed word, it changed us. When we invented electronic word, it changed us. That's all there is, really. I mean, is it really that much different? Well, yeah, it's that much different. It's and but it's not a matter then of the good or the bad. It's the matter of how is it different. Yeah. So if you describe this state of of tactile situational awareness when that a pilot reaches when a plane is about to crash. And then say, okay, that's the state our kids are in all the time. Like, all right, so what are you saying? You're saying our kids are in the state of mind of a plane crash all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right? Maybe they get used to it or whatever, but what's the, what's the, the, the what are the serotonin uh, implications? You know, what are the uh, 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 norepinephrine uh, implications of that? You know, you're saying that that uh, uh, if you want to play even tetrad with that, okay, multitasking, what does it retrieve? The plane crash. <laughs> <clears throat> what about that state of mind? So we've got all these kids walking around like they're in a fucking plane crash. Um, that's something pretty serious. I'm not just saying it's bad. I'm saying it's... You know, on the other hand, when you look at our civilization, oh, we are in the midst of a collective plane crash. We are in a plane crash. So maybe the fact that our kids are are uh, in the state of mind of, of a plane crash is actually rising to the occasion 
of humanity's impending, you know, point of impact. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because um, I asked of Michael Apted 35 years ago, why rock video mi makers feel so obliged to edit fast. He says, because we've learned to take in information faster. And, you know, Marty Scorsese was saying, I edit my films faster because of MTV. So I, uh, I asked this with a bias. Can we indeed learn to take in information faster or are we just brainwashed to believe we can? Oh, we can, but we certain kinds of information transmit faster than others. So as we as we uh, 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 you know as we increase the 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 edit speed, we favor we favor the kinds of information that gets transmitted in the cuts rather than the information that gets transmitted within the segments. Yeah. But do you, you brought it up. Can we literally multitask? Can humans literally multitask? No, I don't even know if we can figuratively multitask. Uh, <laughs> and what's a metaphor? <laughs> 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 right. I mean, that's the thing. I, mean, I don't think, no, we, of course, humans can't. I mean, does our uh, uh, switching capability um, increase over time? Say, yeah, to a point. And we're going to see what that point is. I mean, all of Marshall's, you know, the flip quadrants are always about what happens when you speed it up. What happens when you when you speed up this thing? You flip into its opposite, you know? And what will happen as we flip edits to the extreme is, I mean, in a way you get back to the original film, which is all edit, which is all a sequence of, of shots, any of, of shots anyway, it's an illusion of continuity. So yeah. I don't know what we get to when we get to the extreme of it, but you know, the original purpose of filmmaking the, the 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 purpose of the medium was to create the illusion of continuity whether it was in dw griffiths using a, a, a an outside shot and an inside shot to create the illusion that these are in the same place or whether it's the individual panels of the of the film itself the individual frames creating the illusion that this is one thing when it's actually a whole lot of little pictures um if you you start to do that again in a meta way that now you know all these how how many how short how sequenced can we get and still have that illusion i don't know what we'll see what it flips into um yeah. but something else really good because i always having studied the uh, history of um rapid edit montage you know most people think you know tony conrad doing Flicker is this flip, flicking back and forth between black and white. Well, Abel Gantz did it in 1922. It just didn't catch on until, let's say, MTV to become a norm. Yeah. I just wonder, though, you know, I mean, there was this guy. I went to Princeton, and um, I was a projectionist. I did that for money when I was at yeah. Princeton. I wasn't one of the special, you know, the preppy kids. I liked money um, or knew what money was. <laughs> Because yeah. <laughs> I had to buy stuff with it. Um, um, I worked as a projectionist. And I ended up being the projectionist for this class taught by this guy who turns out he's a famous dude named P. Adam Sidney. Oh, my God. I have a lot of stories about him. He was Go this ahead. bearded guy who knew all about, like, cinema. I know all about this movie. Yeah. Right? And, and so I ended up kind of in the class. And he had me. I had to show these 16 millimeter movies of this guy named um stanley brackage yes you heard of this guy so what he did was like he would just like scratch the film that there was no he didn't take pictures of anything he took the film and he like and then you show these movies that are just like like yeah. scratch, you know so it's it, it's exposed film but there's no he didn't expose it on a thing it wasn't like exposed in a camera and 
it was like really trip. I was probably stoned when I was doing all that too. So it was like, you know, extra trippy, but I was always like, wow, is that medium? You know, it's like that John Cagey kind of era, I guess, when people were asking what is the medium and all, but it wasn't just heady. I think he was also, it was, it was tactile. I think it was uh, it's supposed to be experiential. It was a thing. Yeah. Um, and well, that's the history of experimental film is PM Sydney and Brackage, and you touched on it well. And um, in fact, uh, I asked PM Sydney all the same questions I've asked you today. And I said, What's your favorite form of information? He said, Pillow talk. And that is deep. <laughs> but I don't want to go into that story. I'll tell you sometime. Let's carry on and finish up here. So we'll give room for Clinton to ask a couple in closing. And again, I really appreciate your time. Doug, can you forget to die? You can forget that you're gonna die. <laughs> and I think you can die without knowing it. You know, I mean, that's sort of the way, especially if there's nothing else. You know, a lot of us want to just wake up dead, right? Um, and not have to die. I mean, I've been with a lot of not a lot, but, you know, a few dying people and um, feel really, I mean, privileged. I mean, it's a true mitzvah to be with someone when they die, you know, and I think I've done it sometimes better than others and hope to get to do it more. I mean, because it's such a blessing to to be there for somebody. Um Okay, let's let's get that but was yeah, good. I don't think you can forget to. I think yeah, you can be unconscious of it and you can forget about it. Yeah. But dying is not something to forget. Dying is something to embrace. Dying is is such a uh such an important part. You know, and that was what Leary, you know, uh, what a, a large part of what I got from Leary, especially being with him through his 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 death and his choices about his death was that, yeah. you know, De death is the ultimate taboo, you know, and, and we shouldn't let it be a taboo. We've got to celebrate it in a certain way as part of the design, the design of life. Yeah. And just for uh, our time sense, can you go uh, a few more minutes over 90 or just 90 is the limit? A few, but not a lot because I got okay. family here okay. on New Year's Day. Okay. Yeah, I really appreciate this. Doug, and we could carry on for hours, and I hope we do someday. I got a couple more, and then we'll bring Clinton in. If you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, Doug, what would you say to your 12-year-old self? Um, well, my first thought is uh, get laid as soon as possible. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, just start, just start, um, because you know you 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 there's certain years of it, you could have been doing it, you know, that you weren't. Um, I would jump in, you know, certainly by 17, get there, find somebody, do something, man, woman, whatever. Um, but but experience that. Um, and uh, uh, God knows if I would have written any books, though, if I followed that advice, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, that was a good answer. Very good. And um, you brought up this gentleman earlier, Thornton Wilder, and um, he was a big wakey and he loved Finnegan's Wake. And in 1928, he said, art is confession. Art is the secret told. But art is not only the desire to tell one secret, it's the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. Doug, you've laid your cards on the table for the last 70 minutes, and I'm really grateful, and you've been articulate, and I'm not implying you haven't. What's it really all about for you? Oh, um... Much I, too much so. Still, um, it's about uh, trying to convince others that I'm here in good faith. 
you know i'm i'm still profoundly disturbed when people don't engage with me with a presumption of good faith you know and you know i'm getting that as much or more from what i consider to be my side you know the sort of progressive woke social justice uh, uh, side of the spectrum that there's not there, there's a presumption of bad faith based on my skin color I guess or my apparent gender and sexual choices and I don't um I don't see what good place that takes us. And it it's put me in a, a involuntary defensive posture. So even when we were um, talking about doing this show and you said, oh, we're going to do a live Facebook stream, blah, 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 whatever it is, a live stream at YouTube. And I'm like, oh, man, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't because then I'm conscious of it changes the event because yeah. a live event then for me is colored by the fact that I'm having live impact on people who don't, uh, for, for whom there's no underlying assumption of good faith. No. Yeah. And when there's not, I can't talk. I can't be. It's really, it's really hard. And I gotta learn how to um, I gotta learn how to deal with that because you can't just you can't just preach to the converted, right? That's not. But it's like I want people to disagree with me, but still uh, uh, still take me in good faith, the yeah. way I take them. And um, it's it's it. it the response I get sometimes now is so horrifying, especially when I feel like it's it's not just the people I'm engaged, not just the people in front, but the people behind. Um, that it's leading me to to withdraw. Yeah, which maybe is appropriate. Maybe that's what they want, you know, and that's okay too. That's part of why I started Team Human, the podcast. I'm going to platform others rather yeah. than myself. I've written 20 yeah. books. I'm going to be 60 soon. It's like maybe there was enough, you know, and let them let them go go for it. But um, I, I don't and, and I'm a fine. I'll be courageous, whatever. I guess that's what I got to learn to do. But but I'm 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 profoundly, profoundly troubled and thinking that that that, you know, make myself more scarce and see what happens. Doug, I would take the words of Frank Zappa. Don't stop and keep going. We appreciate what you're doing. I'm going to have one wrap-up question, and uh, Clinton might have one or two to fit in in the last few minutes. Again, thank you. Go ahead, Clinton. Oh, awesome. Thanks for thanks for coming on board. Um, yeah, please do not make yourself scarce, um, Doug. Uh, I love Siberia. Listen, um, it's an absolutely fantastic, fantastic book. Um because I, I'm kind of canary in the coal mine growing up computer um, savvy before everyone else got a phone slipped into their back pocket by Steve Jobs and, and suddenly found themselves on the internet unawares, right? Um, uh, this whole 90s vibe, this, this 90s vibe where everyone is super aware of the computer still, right? You got like Cliff Stoll's KGB computer and me on TV, right? You, you got this, this, uh, this, this, this whole... Um, self-awareness about um designer being and uh and uh, remix culture and clubs uh and what it is the computers are doing that sort of well like it came and it went this awareness and then the effects showed up like a decade later two decades later so many people start noticing that their kids are really weird and but but the hype the public the public discourse about what computers and what media were doing to people was had already come and gone in the nineties. Um, do you, do you see yourself like trying to revitalize 
or like trying to um, talk about keep alive something that that uh, a discourse that has like was concluded hypothetically before it's it was relevant to 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 um, our perceptions. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I've been revisiting Siberia and seeing the stuff I was talking about then in some ways come more true than I thought. So, you know, Siberia wasn't just about the net because the net was barely around then. It was more about like, you know, sort of hypertext and rave and psychedelics and even fantasy role playing. You know, fantasy mm -hmm. role-playing and LARPs were a major part of that book. And what I'm looking at now is these forms of play have become under capitalism and under industrialism. They've become sort of uh, uh, utilitarian or they've become... Uh, 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 you know, looked at for their for 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 utility value. So, the fantasy role playing game reality that we were opening has become like QAnon, and uh, uh, which is a tremendously creative act. It's 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 collaborative storytelling, um, and and it's a yes and fantasy role playing adventure. But instead of using uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons or Lord of the Rings as its source material for this sort of fan fictionized play, it's using the news, you know, and connecting dots in all sorts of other ways and creating backstories and and other stuff, you know. Oh, the, like like the like the secret. Like I remember when a lot of people were writing about the secret gay romance between um, Spock and Kirk, and Star <laughs> Trek fan fiction. There's a whole genre of it that's really fun. It doesn't mean that they actually did it. Plus, they're not even alive. So it's like, it's, it's you're playing with canon. But then when you do the equivalent with like Fauci and Gates, it, it, it's very different. It's no longer fan fiction, especially if you're treating it like reality. So on the one hand, the the designer reality mechanisms that we were all talking about in the early 90s of which technology and computers were one of them they've they've finally have arrived just as we said but the by by refusing to do and to to retrieve and bring forward the necessary kind of uh, moral, spiritual, ethical work that reality creation requires, you know, by basically taking ayahuasca without the shaman, um, mm -hmm. we've ended up in this, you know, collective bad trip. We didn't follow even what Timothy Leary said. You know, it you you gotta be aware of your set and your setting before you drop this stuff. And you know, the the internet is as powerful as DMT, and we've been living on this sort of psychedelic technology substrate for 25 years with the set and setting of surveillance, control, and paranoia. And then we wonder why our civilization is having this collective bad trip. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Our um, our television audience is just as um, fractal noid and digifranoid, <laughs> and and um, you know, overwound as as internet um, uh, users, or are internet users worse? Um, well, I mean, I guess it, internet users may be more advanced in that sense, but television has been absorbed by the net anyway. You know, like Marshall would say, you know, television is just the medium for digital, or television's the content in the new digital medium. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is Netflix? Is Netflix TV? 
or is Netflix digital? Well, Netflix is the content of digital. So I think we're, we're, we're all along for this ride. We're all in the environment, um, you know, whether we're, you know, uh, relating to it primarily through content or through, uh, uh, you know, technologies like TikTok. I think we're all, we're all in it. I mean, CNN is basically reports on Twitter, right? It's the TV, it's the Twitter <laughs> recap of the day. Um, <laughs> God. So yeah. I guess we're, we're all, we're all in it. Really good. Thank you, Clinton. Those were great questions. And again, we could go on for hours. Doug, it's been a real honor and a pleasure. And that's why Marshall updated his aphorism medium is the massage or message to the user is the content mid-career. So the last question, Doug, in closing, thank you so much. What gives you the most optimism? Um, Um, I guess the resilience of young people in all of this, you know, they're, they, um, you know, we all know what's going on all over the place and they're doing their TikToks, right? They're doing their TikToks. They, they are trying to migrate to spaces that are not cruel and where they can do sort of embodied mimesis, right? They do a dance, someone else copies it and all that. So, um, you know, it's that, it's that. I believe the children are our future. <laughs> um, but no, I do have, I do have hope you know, even, you know, that, that I see the way that, that, you know, young people look at and understand Trump, the way young people look at and understand the, the, the you know, social justice warrior orthodoxy. And, um, you know, uh, and the, the, they, they bring a realism to things that's... Um, that's interesting and, and hopeful, you know, whether it's enough, you know, to, uh, uh, we'll see. Either they're going to uh, go down with awareness, you know, so as the ship sinks, they'll be aware of what happened, or they'll be able to, uh, you know, prevent, you know, the entirety of humanity from following this civilization, you know, um, into oblivion. Yeah, that was beautiful. You know, we started, Doug, you know, I asked you, what's the best thing for a human being? You said other people. There's no right or wrong answers to any of these questions, but that one you got right. And the last one you got really right because I've been asking that for 30 years and a lot of people say young people. And they ask Groucho Marx, this is how I got the last question. At the end of his life, they asked him, what gives you the most optimism? And he said, other people. <laughs> so it is a full circle. It's the snake eating itself. Thank you so much, Doug. It's been an honor and a pleasure. You truly enlightened us. And thank you, Clinton. Thank you. Thank you both. I expect a coffee in Venice next time I'm on that side yeah, of things. We will, we will meet at the, the vortex of the universe is the Rose parking lot where we last met. And um, I will welcome that moment. Thank you Great. so much, Doug. Thank you. All right. Take care, man.